All right, we're on our third week of the power of praise. We have thus far looked at the fact that pain is inevitable. All right? It's going to happen. Okay, don't be caught off guard when stuff happens. We weren't caught off guard, were we? No, we're not caught off guard at all. We can move directly into praise. That's what we're supposed to do. What did we do? We praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah. praise ye the Lord, hallelujah. praise ye the Lord. Number two, we try to understand or make sense of things. That's not what we're supposed to do. Do not try and make sense of what is going on in your life because you ain't got enough sense to make sense of what's going on. Is what it boils down to. His ways are not our ways, so we can't get into his thinking process. We have to be along for the ride, basically. Right? So don't try and make sense of it, because we ask why, what's wrong? Did I do something wrong? Is there sin in my life? Is this God testing? Is it the devil tempting? Am I blessed? Am I cursed? We ask all kinds of questions about what we did wrong. When our kids get into trouble, what could I have done better? How many parents beat themselves up over a wayward child and wonder what they could have done better along the way? Don't. If the Lord convicts you of something that you need to go and confess before Him, then do it. And leave it. Because the devil will come and use that stick to beat you up as often as he can. And if you let him, he will continue to use that weapon against you. But if you if you ask forgiveness and leave it, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to believe that. You see, that's faith. And so we don't let the devil beat us up over and over and over and over again by mistakes of our past. They are gone as far as the east is from the west. The only way that those things can come back is if you, by hand, bring them back. You've got to go get them and bring them back. So we don't ask those questions. We go from a circumstance directly into praise is what we're supposed to be doing. Good circumstance, bad circumstance, doesn't matter. But we always detour, and when we detour, we ask why, and we ask whine, and uh, what, and we ask how come. And all of those questions are anything but praise. We're, we're detoured. We are supposed to go instead right into praise. Now it is good if you get detoured that you, you get one of those slaps upside the head and say, thanks, I needed that, Lord. Now I'm going into praise. And you will find out, honestly guys, I'm telling you, you will find out that if you go into a detour and begin to pray about it, you will have the light come on faster and faster and faster each time. The faster you'll run to praise, then the Lord says, good, good, good. We're getting there. It, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to belittle us. I don't want to belittle Christians. But, you know, you might be training a puppy to bark, to speak. And you hold the treat out and say, speak. And they go, Woof! and you say, good enough. Here's a, here's a treat. That was good. That was good. Now, it's not what you wanted. But you're teaching them, aren't you? You're teaching them. So, Woof! is a good start. And then the second time you say, speak, and they go, Rawr. and you go, I don't know what that was, but here's a treat. You're getting the idea. I want a vocal response. What's going to happen in time? They're going to bark. They're going to speak. They're going to recite the Gettysburg Address, or whatever you're trying to teach them to do, right? Yeah. So how do we teach? We teach step by step. We teach our children to do things step by step. Uh, one of the examples I use in my psychology class is that you look at a five-year-old kid and say, I want you to clean your room, don't come out till it's done, and you shut the door. What are the chances of that room really getting cleaned up by a five-year-old who's shut in the door? Zero, right? 
But if you take that child and say, you know, I want you to put all your toys away before supper time. Before you come down and eat, I want your toys put in the toy box. And if you do, then you can have Xbox time or you can have dessert or you can have, you know, uh, mommy will read you a story later. Daddy will sit down and watch uh, watch a show with you or whatever. And so you reward them for cleaning their toys up. Once they become habitual about that and they've got it rolling and they've got the toys being picked up, then you say, oh, you are such a big boy or girl. You are getting so good at this. Look at you. You are cleaning your room so well. Now, let's put our toys away and let's put our clothes in the dirty hamper. And then we'll get a story and then we'll get a fruit roll up and then we'll get the reward and we teach them that see and then pretty soon we say oh, you're getting so tall look how tall you are you are so big and you're doing so good at cleaning your room I think we can learn to make our bed because now you're tall enough to reach and spread it out and so you know if you do it right kids are excited by that they're not bummed by that they're going really can I and you go yeah you're stupid enough to think this is good come on let's go let's do it you know because they're kids and so you teach them to make their bed now what have you done in the end you've taught them to clean their room but you don't just shove them in the door and shut the door and neither does God God doesn't just say hey you're a Christian get it right the first time but sometimes we feel like that's what he wants of us and we get ourselves in a real guilt and condemnation because we fail. Guys, he's more patient than we are. He's more loving than we are. He wants our success more than we do. And so he's going to teach us. So every time you turn from something else to praise, the next time we catch it a little sooner and go oh I didn't spend an hour moping I was only 30 minutes moping and now I go to praise and now I'm doing it in the first 10 minutes and I'm turning to praise and then pretty soon it happens and it's instantaneous step by step yes, we're learning we are having our mind renewed yes, renewing your mind isn't just throwing you in the washer and taking you out and hanging you up later it's not instantaneous right so this is what we're talking about. The faster you begin to catch it and go into praise, the next time it becomes easier and easier and easier. And pretty soon it becomes that instantaneous thing that we catch ourselves rather than going off the detour. We go from circumstance to praise. Number three we said, whether the circumstances from God or from the devil is irrelevant. The Bible doesn't say, give thanks if it's for me. Doesn't say rejoice if I'm in it. Because there ain't nothing God ain't in. There's nothing that he's not involved in. And so we looked at James, and James says, if you have joy, it is to prove your testing. And when your testing gets proven, then you endure. And when you endure, you become perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Do you see the step-by-step -step procedure that I just showed you in the previous slide being shown in this slide now? You see, this is consistent with what we're teaching. That this is biblical. That we get one, but we don't have them all yet. I get the joy. I mean, take a look at this list. This, so many things in the Bible. And I've taught this two or three times. So many things in the Bible are backwards. It starts at the top, but the bottom's where we are. Listen. If you can endure what God puts you through, you can pass the test. And if you pass the test, you end up in joy. You see, I can have joy first, knowing that I'm being tested and endured, but endurance comes first, testing comes second, joy is the result. And that's where we are. And if you want to be perfect, you want to be complete, and you want to lack in nothing, James tells you how to do it. So there's the doggy that speaks when it's supposed to. We've been trained now. We've been trained. We're to be moved into praising him. That's what James and Hebrews taught us. Number four, we said we're to give thanks in all things. 
in the circumstance you're in, do not, when you praise Him, don't even mention the circumstance. Lord, I thank you that I'm in this pickle because I know that you're trying to teach me something and I need patience and I need this and I know that you're doing this and I understand that you... You don't know and you don't understand. Don't put words in God's mouth. God doesn't need explanation. And that's what we're doing. We're saying, well, God, this is a really terrible thing, but you're not terrible, so let me try and explain my way out of this of why a not terrible God would put me in a terrible situation. You have just stopped praising Him, and you just stopped giving thanks. Give thanks in the situation. Give thanks in it. Don't excuse it. Don't try and explain it. Don't try and understand it. I gave the example last week, and I'll give it again, that I got a flat tire, and I was late to work. And I was running late, and then the tire wasn't fully inflated, and it was only partially inflated. And I put it on there, and the whole time I'm getting the tire put on, and I'm working, and I've got the jack, and I've got the, I've got the crowbar, and I've got everything going. And all the time, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not happy at all. I'm late to work. And, and I say, I'm supposed to be praising the Lord. I need to praise the Lord. How can I praise the Lord for a flat tire? Lord, I thank you that I had this flat tire because if I had not had the flat tire, who knows? There might have been an accident down the road and you saved me and spared me from it. Don't do that. Don't make excuses for God. Don't make Him rational. He's God. Don't have to be rational. God, I thank you for this flat tire, and I thank you in this flat circumstance right now. And I have no idea what is going on. I'm not even going to try and guess. But I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to be disciplined, and I'm going to be responsible. And I'm going to do what the Word of God tells me to do, and I'm going to give thanks in this situation. And then shut up. Don't keep adding to it. Because, because... Yeah, the, yeah, just the less we say. And we looked at First Thessalonians and Philippians and said, number five, we are to give thanks for all things. Now, it's one thing to give thanks in something, but how do I give thanks for something that's really nasty and icky and I don't like? Because, again, we don't know what God's doing. We give thanks in all things. Those two verses tell us to give thanks in. But we also give thanks for all things. Look at Ephesians 5 with me. Ephesians 5.15. Now, I like the way this verse starts. I don't know about you. But Ephesians 5.15 says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as... So, you get the feeling he's going to tell us something pretty cool next? I want you to not be stupid. I want you to be smart and be wise. Take your breath and you go, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What's, come on, yeah. Hey, Gail, I'm going to tell you how to be a millionaire and it won't cost you a penny. And you'll be a millionaire in 10 minutes if you do what I tell you. Hey, Ron, how you doing? Good to see ya. Gail's going, hey, hey, what about the million? Hey, hey, come back, you know. It, there's this pause, this don't be like unwise men, but be wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Didn't we say we should expect bad things? Okay. So then, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get, now let's just stop there. Know what the will of the Lord is. What's the will of the Lord for you right now? What have we been learning? Give thanks in all things. That's God's will. For you are in Christ Jesus. Don't be dumb. Don't be stupid. Don't be unwise. He called us three bad things there. And how do we become those bad things? We don't praise Him. Don't be stupid. Praise Him. Don't be unwise. Praise Him. Don't be foolish. Praise Him. That's the will of God. How can you beg God to give you His will and show you His will when you haven't learned to praise Him yet? Come on. He, he, you're going to trust a kid who doesn't know how to ride a bicycle with an 18-wheeler? Here's the keys. Crank her up. Take her out on the highway. 
If we can't handle the little things like praising Him in all circumstances, finding the rest of the will is probably going to be pretty difficult. So, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine. That's a part of this. For that's dissipation. That's wasteful. It's just, it's wasted time. You know, when, when the Lord told me to give up even social drinking, even just beverage drinking at a meal and have a margarita or something like that, He just said, what are you doing it for? Do you know how much money you could spend on missions that go into a bottle or go into your stomach that way? Just do something else with it. Now, I'm not telling, the Lord didn't tell you that. That's what He told me. Okay? We just said, whatever you drink is just wasted. It's just a waste. It's dissipation. It goes in, it goes out. But it's expensive. So it's dissipation. That's what He told me, okay? He said, but instead of getting drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. So I've never said, I've always said, Social drinking is not prohibited in the Bible. But what's important is, why do you drink? That's what the Bible asks. We'll have a glass every once in a while to relax. Hey, you're supposed to be relaxed in Jesus, not in wine. Well, I relax because I'm under stress. Well, you're supposed to give Jesus all your anxiety, not your drink. I mean, when, when alcohol, when social drinking becomes an excuse for leaning on the Lord, then it's wrong. That's all. It's not the drinking that's wrong, it's the why I drink that's wrong. If I just like the flavor of it, and it's a beverage to me, and I have one once in a while, so? But if there's a reason behind the drink, if there's a purpose behind the drink, then you got to rethink it. Does that make sense? It's, it, again, don't make it bigger than it is, guys. Don't make what I'm saying bigger than it is. But 19 says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So we have two verses that tell us to give thanks in, and we got a verse that tells us four, and it's tied intimately to the will of God. It's tied intimately to sobriety and soberness of thought. And being pleasing to God is to give thanks for all things. Let me go back to the flat tire and give you an illustration that I've given before, but it's been years since I gave it. So we might as well get it on video, okay? Uh, this is one of my fav fav famous illustrations uh, that people have bought tapes to hear the, the, uh, when I had a tape ministry. I just had a flat tire. I'm fixing the flat tire. And I do the very thing that I told you not to do. Don't make excuses. Don't make up a story or a scenario. But I'm fixing my tire. And in my mind, I'm going, well, God saved me from an accident down the road. Thank God I had this flat tire. Somebody could have lost control and come across the line. And, and I'm making excuses for God. And I'm feeling good about myself because I'm making all these excuses for God. In other words, God needs to be rational. And I need to make sense of it. I get in my car and I go to work. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty spiritual. You know, I gave thanks in all things and for all things. And I'm feeling pretty hot about it. And I'm telling people, you know, my God is so good. He, he could have spared me today from an accident. He could have spared me from a runaway coyote that would have run out in front of me. And I would have run up a telephone pole and killed three children in a school bus. Who knows? That's how God, how good God is, you know. In my mind, I'm blowing this all out of proportion of why I got a flat tire. Now, I look at my spare that I put on and I realize it's bald. <laughs> the spare is bald. I got to first get the flat fixed. And I got a spare that's bald. I probably ought to replace it too in case I really need to use it. And so I go to one of the tire places in town. I'll just pick big old tires. I go to big old tires and I say, I need two tires for this car. One doesn't have to be too good. If you got a used one, I've, it's got a bald spare. But I need a new one for the car because I got this nail. And he says, yeah, I can't fix that. That nail's in the wrong spot. I can't really repair it. So I'm going to buy two tires. Thank you a lot. So I, 
It's a week later, and I've completely forgotten about the flat tire and the squirrel and the coyote running out in front of me and all the excuses for God why he gave me a flat tire. I forgot about it completely. But at Big O Tire on Friday, they take an inventory and they look at their tires and they go, oh, you know those uh, P38 7419s that uh, uh, we're running low on those. We need some more of those. So uh, let's put an order together. And they put the order together and they get 100 tires together and they call their uh, distributor in the city, you know, their Big O factory or warehouse and they say this is the order we need with we're sending it to you by email and he goes okay thanks and uh, we'll get those out to you on thursday okay you've got enough to get the other i say yeah thursday's fine and so the big old tire warehouse gets the hundred tires and they put them on a truck and they send them up to enid and um and then about a week later, the factory or the warehouse in Oklahoma City does an inventory on computer and says, oh, man, we've got to get some more tires in. We're about 500 tires short. If we had a real run, we'd be really out of it. And so let's put together an order, okay? Let's put together a big order. And so they go to their manufacturers and distributors, and they go to BF Goodrich, and they go to Bridgestone, and they go to Yokohama, and they go to all the different tire companies, you know, and they start ordering tires, and they get an order of about 1,200 tires in. In, okay, and 1,200 tires come in, and, and Bridgestone's the big one. They got a big one from Bridgestone, and uh, and so Bridgestone uh, a week later takes an inventory of their stock, and they say, "Hey, we need to get about we need to get about 10,000 tires in. We need to get about 10,000 in for our national distribution." And so they they order their 10,000 tires, and the manufacturer in Japan looks at their you know factory and they say yeah we've got that to stock out let's put them on a container ship and it'll get there and they'll get it in, you know in about a month and uh, oh but in the meantime we've got to make about uh, 500,000 tires we've got to get the factory you know cooked up so they, they they get a hold of their factory they're in japan and say we need about 500,000 tires uh, about 5,000 tires and they say okay well you know we're we're making about a million tires this week we'll just cut some of those out for you and so the yokohama tire factory in japan looks at their stock and they say you know we're really 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 low on the rubber synthetic that we need and uh, and so get a hold of our distributor in africa in west africa who gets that rubber from the trees and that and makes the component for it and so they get a hold of it and they say we need three container ships full of the rubber component for the tires and 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 so the african uh distributor says okay yeah we've got that and we can ship that out no problem you'll get it in about three months and so it gets there and it gets in a container ship and it's going and then they they look and they say but we need to get some more from the plantation and so they call the plantation in africa and say we we need for you to cut more and get more rubber come for us and that day uh, a man gets a message in his village that hey uh, the rubber factory is hiring right now and would you come and would you, you know I'd, I'd, I'd go apply for a job because they've got a big job that's going to last a month or two and and you can get a job out there right now sorry that little man in Africa calls his pastor across the village and says, Hey, remember when we prayed Sunday for me to get a job? It's been four months since I had a flat tire. But God knew that that man was going to pray for a job. And God said, I'm going to listen to the voice of my servant. But for him to get his job, McLaren's got to get a flat. Now. Just now. So that in four months, his prayer will be answered. Now, is that too much out of the realm of possibility? But how many of us would think that far, that distant, that deep as to why I got a flat tire? You see, it makes my accident look kind of silly, doesn't it? Yeah. We have no idea what he's up to on a global stage. We're just supposed to give thanks for it and leave the reason to him. Look, 
think of the story I just told you. Think of the story and how logical and how practical that really is in the big scheme of things. And read this verse again with me, okay? Therefore, be careful how you walk. Careful how you think. Careful how you talk. Don't be unwise, but be wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Dear Jesus, I need a job. Please, could you provide me with a job? What's God's will? To give him his job. A world away. Four months in the past. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation. But instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. Do you think that if you got a flat tire and God whispered in your ear, you just got a flat tire so that Kabongo can get a job in Africa? I mean, if it was really the voice of God, wouldn't you say, Cool. Use me, Lord. Oh my goodness, what a tool. I'm a tool of the Lord. Give Gabongo a job. If he whispered that in here, it'd be a great time to rejoice. Well, guess what? How do you know he isn't? You see? We gotta change our thinking, man. We gotta get outside of us and get global. We serve in a global army. And a global God. Singing, making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God. Even the Father. My Father and Gabongo's Father. Right? Well, we only got one thing done, but that's all right. You learned something? We got more to go. We got more to go. We got seven of these to go. And so we'll get, uh, I have one more illustration I'll be sharing with you that is, uh, I'm kind of famous for, I've shared it at this church a couple times, but there's one more out of this teaching. I hope the, t I hope the stories bring it home. I hope the a lot of times we remember the parable more than the teaching, right? And hopefully the parables that I give you, when you are up against the wall, the story will come back. And you'll think about the little man in Africa. And that I need to be giving thanks because I don't know what's going on. This could be so much far reaching than I ever dreamed. Just remember that. We are a part of the global army. And what he calls us to do can affect people all around the world because that's the way prayer works. Don't we pray for people in other parts of the world and expect them to be answered? Yes, sir. Sure we do. Well, what if they're praying and we're a part of the answer? We don't know. So why guess? Why make excuses? Just jump right into praise. For that is the will of God for you. Amen. Let's circle up.